All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and Dr. Call. It's good to see you again. Congratulations on your nomination. Thank you for your willingness to take on this important and challenging position. So I really enjoyed our conversation last week. As you know, I have long been concerned about civilians who are harmed as a result of our overseas military operations. I've introduced two separate comprehensive bills to improve transparency and reporting of civilian casualties, as well as strengthen how we investigate and address cases when civilians are harmed by US or US-led military operations. Now, you've written persuasively on the need for stronger measures to track and learn from civilian casualties in order to prevent unnecessary harm in the future. If you're confirmed, will you commit to finding ways to bolster DOD's response to civilian casualties? For example, by dedicating resources to investigate, address, and understand patterns of civilian harm? Uh, yes, Senator, I, I, I'm strongly committed on this issue. We need to be more transparent. The reporting needs to be better. Uh, there have to be uh, the right investigations uh, and steps in place to address civilian harm, however inadvertent, uh, when when our uh, military is engaged in operation. So I know there's a DOD instruction um, that's being written as we speak. Uh, if I'm confirmed, I look forward to digging into that and working with you and others on this issue to, to uh, minimize civilian harm moving forward. Good, well, I really appreciate that. You know, over the last several fiscal years, Congress has provided the DOD with funding to make offers ex gratia of payments to civilians harmed in the U.S. and U.S.-led coalition operations. Uh, and uh, these are cash payments. Uh, yet, as I understand it, very few payments have been made and no claims process exists. So can you commit to reviewing this issue expeditiously and working to find ways to establish an effective claims process for families and survivors of military operations? Yes, I commit to that. Good. Dr. Call, some of my colleagues have criticized the Iran nuclear deal because it didn't address Iran's ballistic missile program and because of the sunset provisions. They believe that the deal didn't put Iran's nuclear program in a box. I think it's worth setting the record straight on just a few things. So I just want to ask you, the Iran nuclear deal placed strict limits on Iran's ability to enrich uranium needed for a nuclear weapon. During the deal, was Iran complying with those limits? Uh, according to about a dozen IAEA reports uh, prior to President Trump's withdrawal from the agreement, uh, Iran had been in compliance. Yes. And since the Trump administration pulled out of the deal, has Iran exceeded the limits imposed by the deal? Yes, in a number of areas. Yes. So today is Iran's breakout time to have a nuclear weapon shorter than it was when Trump went against our allies and pulled out of the deal. Uh, according to open source analysis, it's currently down to three or four months. It was at it was at at least a year at the end of the Obama administration. Okay, so Iran's nuclear program was actually in a box when the deal was in force, and they are now closer to having enough material to make a nuclear weapon today than they were under the deal. I guess we can all thank President Trump for making Iran even more dangerous today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cole, and thank you, Mr. Chairman.